is my full name is Raymond A. Montgomery Jr. And it was too long to put on the book. So Bantam, my original publisher, cut it to R.A. Montgomery. And all of a sudden, people started calling me R.A. years ago when they first came out. But I'm Ray. I mean, I'm just, and my, my uh, blog, I have a blog that's been up and down. It's been a tough couple of years. And um, we lost uh, our oldest son uh, two years ago. And that threw a real spanner in the works, as you can well imagine. So I didn't do it that much. But um, on the blog, it says, call me Ray. Uh, because people think, R.A., why does, you know, isn't that kind of a conceit to uh, call himself by his initials? So call me Ray. Surprised, enormously surprised and gratified. Um, when I say gratified, I think, Matt, what I mean is um, we all make choices in our lives. And the choices were open to me. I could have gone to law school or a business school. I could have become a broker in New York. I chose not to do those things. I did work for the Wall Street Journal for a while in the education division. Uh, and then I went up town to Columbia University and ever since then my goal has really been in education. Um, what is that all about? I, I think that's making an impact, trying to make an impact um, on kids. Um, and that's really what I've done with my life. So when the books took hold, um, it was enormously gratifying. Uh, teachers love them, librarians love them, parents love them, but the kids are the ones who really drove it. And so I was writing for the kids, and I still am. I finished a manuscript yesterday. <laughs> I've written about 70 of them. I have been involved in education one way or another uh, basically ever since college. And I worked for a while for the Wall Street Journal in their education division. And then I worked for Columbia University. And then I set up my own school, a summer school for kids who are not doing particularly well. And I wanted to break the traditional mold of learning by rote and by uh, assignment and by... Um, actually, often education can seem somewhat uh, that it's, it's punishing a kid. So I did a lot of gaming with these kids. For instance, there were math kids who hated math. So I hired a, a young guy fresh out of college, very bright, and I gave him um, a bunch of money and I said, go to a game store and buy everything that you think that would teach a kid something about set theory and numbers and break down the resistance. And it worked amazingly well. And then gradually over the course of the summer, we got them into doing algebra. And, you know, we broke down the resistance by getting them involved in the process. For the kids who are having trouble with English, reading and writing, which is a huge problem in our country. I mean, we're supposed to be the best educated. We're not. And in science, we're about number 29 in the world. So, in the English portion of this, we had kids read books and then write stories, starting with paragraphs. A red pencil never touched a kid's paper. It just didn't, because that says you're wrong. Something's wrong with you. So, it was all a lot about getting kids involved in the process. Then we gave them... Um, uh, video cameras and, and tape recorders and asked them to write a film and to make it. And groups of five would get together and they'd make films. All of a sudden you had kids really involved in what they were doing. After that, I went to Cambridge, Mass and was involved with a think tank down there called Apt Associates. This is quite a few years ago. And that exposed me to role-playing simulation games, if you know that whole modality, where you take a role and that you basically go through that role, achieving, trying to achieve the goals that the role sets out, um, playing against or with 
anywhere from 15 to 30 other people. And it was time-phased, task-oriented, goal-driven, and very powerful stuff. So I learned a lot about that at that point and game theory. I read a lot about game theory. And game theory goes way beyond just the economic gaming, which often turns out wrong, as we know today. But I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of simulation design. And uh, the one that I enjoyed the most was for the U.S. Peace Corps, um, where we, uh, you know, in the, in the Peace Corps, it's an inverted pyramid. And why I say inverted pyramid is that in most corporations, virtually all corporations, the top of the corporation is the president, the vice president, etc. Everybody works for them. Well, you take that pyramid and flip it. Now you've got the volunteers at the top and the head of the Peace Corps mission in the country, whether it be Africa or India or Latin America, wherever it happens to be, is there to support the volunteers. It's a very hard concept to get when you've got some relatively young um, you know, uh, executives at IBM or John Deere or people like that wanting to volunteer for two years, probably their bosses wanted them to, whatever reason, and all of a sudden they're thrown into a world in which they're at the bottom supporting all these volunteers at the top. That led to a lot of confusion. So I uh, developed a major simulation that allowed Peace Corps staff in Washington to play the roles of volunteers and also Peace Corps staff in Washington to play the role of new country directors and associate directors, all the, you know, all the infrastructure in that country. And it put them through a full eight hours of role playing in which you know, the volunteers wanted to demonstrate against the war in Vietnam. This is quite a few years ago. And, of course, the Peace Corps dictum is, no, no, you, you join the Peace Corps, you got to give up demonstrating in country. It just isn't going to work. You're there as their guest. But the volunteers are saying, we don't like the war, and we don't like this, we don't like that. And, and yet the staff has got to work with the country. And it's a lot of conflict. Well, at the end of the day, with all these meetings and all these confrontations, and all of a sudden you'd slip, the game director would slip a piece of paper that said three volunteers have been caught up country uh, smuggling uh, drugs. It was, and, and then the note to the, the country director was, it's not true they're being framed. But all of a sudden, that's like reality. It stops the game, doesn't it? Or it stops what was going on in the game. So that had to be taken care of. All these things. Now, what was the point of this? The point of this was to get the people who were playing these, playing these roles in real life to be sensitive to the problems that uh, Peace Corps country directors and staff members and uh, all the rest of the development staff will face overseas. And the most important aspect of that gaming experience was probably not the game itself, it was the discussion that led after the game. So. This is experiential learning. This is game development. This is simulation design. And I've explained this to a lot of people, and I'm, I have a feeling, Matt, that you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but people who don't, I would say, well, look, an architect builds a, a model of a house. Um, a designer of boats puts a hull through a wave tack. Um, a, an airplane model is built for wind tunnels to see what happens with the laminar flow of, of uh, wind over the airfoil. Um, war games are built on sand tables. Uh, the business schools use um, a modification of this in case study, um, moot court, in the legal system. Gaming is at the heart of an awful lot of stuff. So teaching if it's not lecture, lecture, test, regurgitation, all that kind of stuff, but if it's experiential where you're given an opportunity, it's very powerful, and I believe in that. So what is Choose Your Own Adventure? Let's take a look at Abominable Snowman. I think you have that one in your hand. Maybe, maybe not. Whatever. Okay, Abominable Snowman. It kind of opens up and it says, 
you are a world famous mountain climber despite how young you are and you and your best friend are at the bottom of Mount Everest. And the kid reading this says, whoa, yeah, I'm a, I'm a famous mountain climber. And your friend is missing in the ice fall. Now the ice fall is the terminal moraine of the glacier that's, you know, coming down on Everest. And this is a real kill zone. And the book is telling you about this. And there are huge ice needles, seracs, that by 11 in the morning, even at that altitude, 18,000, 19,000 feet, the sun is working on those giant ice needles and making them unstable and they're beginning to waver and they can crash. And a lot of people get killed in that ice fall. So here's your choice. You, you the reader, and it says it right in the book, you can choose to go into the ice fall after your friend Antonio. You're not sure he's there and it's very dangerous. Or you can choose to wait until the Nepal Royal Air Force helicopter rescue team gets there. But the Rongbuk Glacier is filling with clouds already. It might not be able to make it. Choose now. And if you choose to go into the glacier, that's the death zone, go to page six. If you choose to wait for the helicopter, go to page seven. Now you can imagine people making these decisions. And you read these books as a kid. And actually, a lot of adults read them, too. Um, it's, it's finally saying to you, you're involved. What, do you, what are you doing? And why are you making these choices? So implicit in the choice is an ethical or moral uh, approach or decision, but that is never spelled out, and it is never sold. Whatever you decide is what you decide. A little bit of postmodernism in there, although I'm anti-postmodernist. Um, so that's what it is. It's just an exciting way of getting people involved in their lives. And I had always hoped that this would um, make some profound changes um, in the way people make decisions about their lives, uh, about the lives of their children, about politics, all the rest. And I'm still very optimistic about that. That's kind of a long answer. Very straightforward, Matt. Um, a book is a storage and retrieval mechanism, pure and simple. I happen to love books, physical books, and a major room in our house is our library, and I love it. And um, there is a TV in there, but it's not a TV room. It's a book room. The um, human brain is a storage and retrieval mechanism. The computer is a storage and retrieval mechanism because it simulates the way a brain thinks. It can learn and become a smart system and deviate from where you think the path is going. The book will not. Our books do because they're interactive. They allow a certain freedom. Um, but the best way to enhance that would be to put it on a computer. And if you don't like the ending, write your own. And I think that, you know, we will get there and, and we'll have that done. But going back to your original question about computer games, um, there are two types of games. Of course, there's the video game, which often is eye hands coordination game. Um, not entirely, but a lot of those are. Uh, and then there is the, um, the game that is on the Internet and multiplayer. Uh, we know that the world of Warcraft is the major paradigm for that. Um, I think that all these gaming situations open up a world to people, whether they be kids or adults, that allows them not just to fantasize, but to indulge in exactly what Choose Your Own Adventure does, which is to pretend without the risk of the real world to try stratagems out, to develop an approach to, in the world of Warcraft, to develop alliances, to um, make stratagems, all the rest of that. So I embrace it. I, I embrace it and I embrace um, human beings pushing beyond 
just statements of fact or uh, a linear storyline. It doesn't mean I don't love uh, books. I mean, I read all the time. I read a lot of literature. I read a lot of um, history. Um, I read, po uh, I also like science, so I, I indulge in all those things. But the minute you get an opportunity to allow the reader to become the participant, which is choose your own adventure books, but it's also the video game, it's also the internet game, I think there's tremendous advantage to that. Well, a lot. Um, people have often asked me that. Now, part of this comes out of my direct experience of travel. And when I travel, I read a lot about those countries. Um, although I was an English major in college, um, my graduate work uh, was macroeconomics, if you can believe that. I was very interested in the basic human problem, and that's, that's the economic problem, which is, it's not money. It's the allocation of scarce resources, food, clothing, housing, safety, all that. Now, then came the money economy instead of barter and exchange, et cetera. And the money economy, we know what's happened to that. Um, so I bring to this, to these books, a level of interest and a level of research. So I'll research a country or something like that. If it's a total adventure story, then maybe I won't. But you know, there's a lot of research in it. And I would say that there's a good four to six to seven weeks of research. And then there's, if the writing goes really well, um, five, six, seven, maybe eight or nine weeks. And if I can tell you about a recent book that I wrote, um, two of them actually, but one necessitated a lot of research, was WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, associated with the International Olympic Committee. And WADA's goal is to have a level playing field. Play true is their, their password. So they don't want athletes taking steroids or performance-enhancing drugs. And the Olympic Committee is behind it, and uh, I think there are something like 120 nations in the Olympics, and most of them have uh, come along and uh, embraced this idea that, you know, we, we just don't want to deal with performance-enhancing drugs. And there are a lot of different ones, but we all know the anabolic steroids, and blah, 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 blah. Very dangerous. These things are horrendously dangerous. So they asked me, they came to me, and they said, well, Ray... We like your books, and your books are choice-driven. And young athletes, like junior and senior high school athletes, have life decisions to make. And there's a lot of drugs out there for these kids. So would you be willing to write a book for us? And I said yes immediately, because that's exactly what I want to do, is to help kids come to terms with their own life and the choices that they make and the results of those choices. But again, remember what I said, Matt, before, and I noticed you smile when I said, everyone's got the right to fail. We can try again. We can do different things. That's human nature. So uh, I said yes, and I wrote a manuscript called Track Star, which takes place in a high school. And a lot of these kids want to get into a university with a scholarship, and if you're good in a sport, that does help you sometimes. And then there's the temptation to enhance your thing. So I did a lot of research. A lot of that research was provided by um, WADA, the World Anti-Doping um, Association, and through um, the International Olympic Committee. And it, I, I was very careful about that, extremely careful. And that is finished and it's out there, um, and WADA is giving it away. Um, they're giving it away in English and French, it's going into Turkish, German, Arabic, and it's, we think it's going to open to a lot of countries. And I'm very proud of that. It's something that I wanted to do and, um, when I first heard it. And um, so there's an example. There was a lot of research that was provided for me so that 
if we say something, we try to really substantiate what it's about and make it, you know, verifiable. Well, uh, the answer is equivocal, Matt. Um, I thought about it. And then I really thought, I'm a kid's author. I'm not going to change. And then I thought the paradigm of uh, choices for adults, particularly in today's world, uh, can get edgy very fast. And I thought, I don't want to confuse my market of kids with anything that would get uh, even questionably edgy. Not that it would necessarily, but I thought, I'm going to stick with my market. Now, and that's what I've done. I really have done that. At the same time, I wrote a manuscript about 500 pages, not interactive at all, for adults on modern day China and the prospect that modern day China um, is poised to fall apart um, just the way China over its 5,000 year history has come together and fallen apart, come together and fallen apart. So that novel is a result of a lot of reading and research that I did on the economy of China, on the politics of China, the history, the art, the culture, the religions, all that. I just got really deeply involved. And it's not interactive. It is straightforward uh, story about all those different um, energies, those force vectors in Chinese society. And I finished that about oh, five years ago. And um, I got soundly rejected by 26 publishers. Thank you very much. They said I hadn't made the transition to uh, writing for grown-ups. Well, I don't think that's true. Uh, at any rate, um, then I got a wonderful agent, uh, and he said, I need about a 15 or 20% rewrite, Ray. Um, uh, you're revealing too much in the opening chapters. Um, he said, you're, uh, he said, pull stuff back. And at that point, I got control of Choose Your Own Adventure again, and we became our own publisher. So I've set that novel aside. And since then, things have happened in China which are very similar to what I was saying in this manuscript. And I'm anxious to get back to it. But it's not Choose Your Own Adventure. It's not interactive. It's a straight uh, story. Um, well, there's a German phrase, Bildungsroman, which is, you know, the story of becoming, how a person matures and grows up. And it's a story about um, a young American slash Australian stringer for a TV station in Hong Kong. And what he goes through as he uncovers various plots to bring China down. And those plots come from different countries and within. So uh, to get back to your original question, have I thought about writing for Choose Your Own Adventure for, for adults? Yes, but in passing, I decided that uh, I would stay true to my métier, which is kids. On the side, I did write a major, well, for me, a major work. Um, we'll see if it ever gets published. I don't know. I think you're right there. I think the 7 to 14 year old age group is right on the money. And then we do a dragon lark version for younger kids, which is about half the length and half the word, less than half the words, and beautifully illustrated with color. And that's working. But there have been other, other attempts to do um, adult type choose your own adventure or for older kids. And they haven't worked, and I'm not sure why. doesn't mean that it can't. Uh, because remember, as I told you, um, this is all about simulation design. This is all about game theory. And that works for all of us. I mean, within every one of us is that child who will embrace challenge and change without fear. And part of what we're doing is we're saying everybody's got the right to fail. And if you fail, start again. That's what Choose Your Own Adventure is about, too. 
So I think, yeah, I actually think it would be better in a film. Well over 200. Well, I think Abominable Snowman, um, I was really, really taken by Nepal. Um, I think that um, Mystery of the Maya is good. I think that Chinese Dragons is one of my favorites of all time. Um, both my boys wrote books uh, for me, and so all of those are my favorites too. And my wife, Shannon Gilligan, has written probably 10 of them. Um, we just came out with uh, my son Ramsey, the, the boy that we lost. Um, he was teaching uh, English in Saigon, Vietnam, and uh, died of a stroke, a massive stroke, while reading in bed, which um, uh, is a kinder way to go, uh, but still far too early. But um, uh, it's called um, Mission to Malawa, and uh, that's become my favorite book because it reminds me of him. Well, I, you know, probably the best way to do that is you've got copies of the books. Make a map. Make a map of what pages go where. And that shows you exactly how the books are constructed. And it, it's simply uh, what it is, is <clears throat> maybe the best way to look at it is If you like tennis as a sport, for instance, there's a tennis ladder. And, you know, at the uh, Australian Open, which is being played right now, um, that ladder uh, opens up in the beginning with, I don't know, what, 60 players or 80 players, whatever it is. And then it goes down and down and down and down and ends up at one. Well, flip the ladder around and you've got you at the beginning and you make a decision, and it goes to another branch, another branch, another branch, another branch, and then other branches, and then other branches. So each storyline is um, a discrete storyline that ends at about 10 pages. But if you went back and read the other choices, there'd be another storyline that is another 10 pages. And then you go to the other branch, and, you know, there's another 10, and there's another 10, so... Uh, that's really the way you build it up. Uh, we had some mathematicians years ago, just out of sheer interest, um, do some permutation analysis to figure out how many choices and how many endings there were. And it's amazing. There are an awful lot, an awful lot of endings. In a 120-page book with 18 endings, you could have about 200 different storylines. Now, a lot of them are fairly similar, but the twists and turns... Uh, that you might make, those permutations, um, which I was not programming. I just threw the stuff out there. There's no message in it. There's no, I'm not selling a point of view. You, you decide what your point of view is when you finish it. I would say do it, and here's the reason to do it. The publishing world is tough. There's just no question about it. But it has changed enormously just in the last few years because of technology. And you can self-publish. And now there are the e-books. There's Kindle. We have 32 of our Choose Your Own Adventure books available on Kindle since, uh, since the middle of uh, November. Um, Barnes & Noble has a, a, a reader called The Nook. Um, Apple is coming out with, Sony has the e-reader. Uh, you can write a book and you can publish it yourself because you can buy the tool to convert it into a digital format. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Um, but I think out of this is going to grow an outpouring of creativity from people. And I think there will be a forum for people's books um, or stories or whatever you want to call them, to be looked at and to be heard and to get voice. 
After all, all this is about is voice, letting our voices be heard and hoping that the, the voice that we have will echo for people, that it will have meaning, that it will touch people's lives. And in so doing, of course, it touches our own life. Um, that's what I think. I'm optimistic and um, I will remain so. always negative uh, things in the world and uh, but overwhelmingly positive acceptance of this uh, because I think that uh, parents are delighted that kids like it and like to read and that if it, uh, you know um, if a parent's reaction with a kid is well uh, son how'd you do in school today all right um, anything exciting nothing um, well, what else, son? Whatever, Dad. But if the parent brings up this thing and says, well, what did you choose? Would you go into the ice ball after your friend? And all of a sudden, the discussion starts. So it opened that up for the teacher. It opened it up for the kids. It opened it up for the parents. And that was very positive. Um, yeah, I would say for the most part, it's been very positive. We had a very nice thing happen the other day. Well, what we learned just a few days ago is that Wikipedia gave a listing of the 100 best-selling series, both adult and children. Harry Potter was number one. We're number six. Oh, the combined writings of Mao Zedong are number three. But uh, that's because I think everybody in China at one point was required to buy it. We got them from Germany, we got them from Spain. Germany and Spain were very good about royalty reports um, on the dot. The, the others were very, very hard to uh, ever penetrate. So 250 is a good solid number. It's probably three to 400 million, something like that. I've traveled a lot in India and Nepal and done a lot of trekking in Nepal, which is unbelievable stuff. I mean, uh, well, it's, it's, it's an experience. You really get in touch with things there. Um, I've spent time in Japan, little time in China. Um, Peace Corps in Africa was just amazing. French West Africa, Francophone Africa. Um, Europe, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Europe. And, of course, in our own country. But, yeah, I like to travel. I like to play sports. I love to read. And I like writing. I mean, that's basically my life. I've never really climbed at uh, Everest. But I have done a lot of very serious climbing and trekking uh, in Nepal and in Europe and in the United States. And a lot of the stories are reality-based for me. Um, that I've had that experience. I've traveled an enormous amount, and I read a lot too. Um, but I've traveled a lot, and I've done a lot of the things that I talk about. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, people have asked me that before, and I think that you know my history of being a teacher, and I've taught both on the. Um, high school level and on the college level, and some on the graduate school level, is that I am tremendously impressed with the creativity that is within all of us. Not just bright people, but virtually everybody. It is there. And you give the people tools to achieve some of that creativity, to let that go, to ex expand it and explore it. And you give them a paradigm to do it. Um, sky's the limit. And I think that choose your own adventure, what is the paradigm there? It's that you are the hero of the story. And you make choices leading to different types of outcomes. And although you might eventually say that's a bad outcome, I failed, I've got to go back to something new, free yourself. Free yourself from judgment. Allow the active brain, the, the searching mind, um, to make those choices and to take those risks 
So um, now I'll give you one thing that uh, I think uh, has helped me enormously. And um, as I say, you know, uh, I read a lot. Maybe you know this book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Read it, read it again, read it again, read it again, and read it again. And I have read it about seven times. And I put little, I underline it, and I put little bookmarks in it. And Matt, this is the thing that's really impressed me about that book, is almost every time I read it, I underlined different things. So the depth of that book is amazing. And this might show, you know, kind of my my thinking about where I'm at in my life and what I'm thinking about is we are all on that path and we are all given challenges. And the challenges, when he talks about, you know, the challenge is to walk the hero's path bravely and courageously to learn and to give that learning back to the others coming along behind us. That's, that's the hero's path. That's, that's, he's talking Buddhism there, really. So for game developers, um, don't be afraid. Just go out there and understand that we are all confronted uh, with choices every day of our life. And that it's new, it's exciting, sometimes it's really, really hard. And as I say, you know, losing a child is, you know, I... Every day I have to deal with that. And, uh, and yet I'm not turning my back on life. That's the message that came out of that. Not turning your back on life, even when it hurts. And I can tell you, man, it hurts every day. Every day. I'd just like to hand, hold up this picture. That's Ramsey. That's our oldest son that we lost. And there he is in Vietnam. He's a wonderful guy, just a wonderful, wonderful guy. My final message is everybody's got a huge amount of talent. All you got to do is uncover it. <laughs>